Uh, it's nice to see, see you again. We recently had uh, a, a national event on Ireland uh, for the same project, and I'm very uh, happy to be able to uh, join you once more. Um, I think it's very important to start by saying that this project and the specialization on the assistance of migrant women and girls is fundamental, uh, uh, and it comes at a very important timing. And it comes at a very important timing because, as we know, there are some actors that are desperate to prove that trafficking for sexual exploitation doesn't happen. And it would be important to understand the need to keep uh, this uh, ply of women visible. During my mandate, I explicitly and consistently ensured that the gender dimension of trafficking was fully acknowledged that it was addressed and taken into consideration in any measures we took at the EU level. We worked extensively on the gender specificity of the trafficking. And in fact, you can find uh, the speech that I gave for the, this event uh, only a few weeks ago, where we, we list all the work that we have done. Um, and this project is part of these efforts uh, to ensure that women and girls are not invisible. Because even when we see that, there, that trafficking for sexual exploitation has been consciously and uh, very, in a very targeted way sidelined in terms of law enforcement efforts, awareness raising campaigns, and even political will sometimes, we cannot hide the victims. We might say that this is a hidden form of trafficking. I actually think that we cannot hide what is there. Despite all these attempts, we see the large volumes, unfortunately, of trafficking uh, for sexual exploitation in Europe and, and beyond, of course. Um, what I want to say that I, I want to start by conveying some messages to the, to the speakers that are very distinguished and instrumental to the work that we need to do ahead. Um, I would also like, I hope that they can mention in their speeches also uh, the, some of my concerns. It's very clear to me after 10 years of experience and speaking in my personal capacity, but also before as the EU anti-trafficking coordinator, I used to say that we don't need any new legal instruments at the regional or international level on trafficking per se. We shouldn't change definitions of the crime. We, would, we shouldn't touch the Palermo Protocol, the Council of Europe Convention. In fact, there is an urgent need to ensure that we ratify and correctly implement the existing legal uh, instruments, including the EU uh, directive, of course. Um, so I think that's fundamental, and I'd like to hear from the, from the speakers on that. Also, what we need to be doing is to complement the current legal framework at the EU level, to add to that, and to criminalize the use of a victim of trafficking. And also what I heard from many members of the European Parliament, from many member states, but most importantly from many prosecutors um, throughout the EU member states, is that we cannot treat all forms of exploitation in the same manner, because different forms of exploitation vary and we need different criminal proposals. So as I said many times, paying for forced sex, like raping a woman basically, is not the same as paying for strawberries by the, by the street side. So what is interesting is that some member states have done so, they have criminalized and others have not. And I think the only hurdle is political will rather than anything else. My message for today, before I give the floor, is that we really need to move towards this criminalization of, of users as soon as possible at the EU level. Otherwise the work we have been trying to do will have little effect. And we should start with sexual exploitation. And why? I think this is very important. The user comes into direct contact with the victim. It's very clear. Into physical contact with the victim and to intimate contact with the victim. So the way to do this is crystal clear. And many, many uh, judges, uh, attorney generals that I spoke to, uh, lawyers agree with this. So the obstacles are not legal or even moral. They, uh, I think, no, I'm not, I don't think, I know that they rely on financial and political motivations. So three messages, and I, I give the floor uh, to our panelists. 
despite everything that we have all done, I think there's 140 people online, and I think we have all worked tirelessly for, for, in a in tireless manner from different uh, perspectives uh, to address this issue. But we're failing. And why are we failing? There's three reasons, very quickly. The, the first is the political will to reduce the phenomenon is not there. We pay lip service, but we don't really want to change things. And this takes me to my second reason, which is that there exist obvious and systematic efforts by various stakeholders with clear vested interests, at least financial, to normalize the crime of trafficking, especially for the purpose of sexual exploitation. And number three, we turn to concentrate on the paralegal and illegal economy. Well, I think we should be focusing a lot more on the legal environment. We should focus a lot more on profits made in the legal sectors rather than the uh, illicit sectors. And the commission has done incredibly good work on the money laundering direct with the money laundering directive to this effect. So we have to stop hiding behind vulnerability. So I hope there's not going to be a speaker in the next hour who starts saying, oh, victims are vulnerable and that's why they're trafficked. Victims are not trafficked because they're vulnerable. They're trafficked because there are perpetrators behind them, because there's profit makers behind them, because there's exploiters and there's users. And in the case of sexual exploitation, there's rapists behind them. So let's not hide behind excuses and let's just be direct and clear. And if we continue allowing them to remain unpunished and focusing at the end of the chain, what happens once a girl has been victimized and raped 5,000 times, I don't think we're gonna get very far. So with that, I will, uh, I will stop and I hope some of my points will be um, addressed in the speeches. And I will start with our, very, with our first and very distinguished speaker. I'm very, very uh, happy to introduce to you Dalia Lenarte, who is the chair of CEDO, Subcommittee on Trafficking on Women and Girls. I don't want to get this wrong, so I'm reading it. So, and she's, of course, working on the CEDO General Recommendations 38 on Trafficking of Women and Girls in the context of global migration. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Miria, for, for this uh, very kind introduction, and Anna, uh, too. And it's really my pleasure uh, to talk to all of you just right after the uh, adoption of this um, a new general recommendation, number 38, on trafficking in women and girls in the context of global migration, that was adopted just last uh, uh, month. So uh, the document is uh, meaning lengthy and many, many points are, are, are touched and it's not possible right now to overview uh, all of them in 10 minutes. But um, what um, uh, concerns Miria's, um, uh, uh, Miria's points, I really would like to stress you that uh, general recommendation number 38 is the first international instrument with the power of monitoring and uh, reporting uh, by state parties that in its um, soft law document included uh, the addressing of the demand side. We are the first one after, uh, after adoption of the protocol that it would be reflected in the legal document. Another thing is, I remember very well, and thank you that Miriam uh, reminded it me, uh, to define trafficking in women and girls as a form of violence. And I remember in 2017, uh, I think so, um, when uh, very much important general recommendation, CEDO general recommendation number 35 on gender-based violence uh, was adopted. Uh, I requested uh, the working group and the chair, I requested that uh, exploitation of prostitution would be recognized uh, as a form of violence. No way. I didn't succeed. So, but right now with this new recommendation, prostitution, exploitation of prostitution is recognized as a form of um, uh, violence. Uh, so 
In uh, general recommendation number 38, uh, 38 uh, which is based on the previous CEDOS jurisprudence and um, uh, goes uh, more further, uh, root causes of trafficking in women and girls have been uncovered in five main groups. This is um, socioeconomic injustice, discrimination in migration and asylum regimes, then lack of addressing by state parties demand that fosters exploitation and leads to trafficking, and then situation of conflict and humanitarian emergencies, and the use of digital technology in trafficking. So the notion that in qualities women face globally make migrant women particularly vulnerable to trafficking is especially stressed in the general recommendation, thus making assistance to victims important part of this soft law. It is stressed in the document that identification of victims must be performed by multidisciplinary teams, including professionals, from all relevant fields that the point that was uh, that has been stressed by by speakers be before me and before Miria, which so far often is not a case as the CEDO learn from individual communications that the committee receives. The general recommendation also encourages that victims can safely go to the authorities without fear for negative consequences such as prosecution, punishment, detention, or deportation for immigration, labor, or other offenses related to their being a victim of trafficking. The CEDO also calls for adequate assistance provided to women and girls with disabilities who are particularly vulnerable group to be trafficked recently. The general recommendation ensures that assistance services and social inclusion programs for all women impacted by trafficking are provided on an informed and voluntary basis and victims, neither their children, are not forcibly kept or detained in shelters or rehabilitation programs against their will in compulsory protective detention, including for witness testimony purposes. This document, general recommendation, also pays attention that compensation as a victim should have no impact on social assistance received by victims or as provided by another uh, state, other state program. Assistance to victims of trafficking is of course part of national referral systems and traditionally it has been viewed the way of the system once a trafficking case has occurred. Yet the strength of the referral system concept also have potential in preventing trafficking cases. It is especially relevant timely recognizing cases of emerging new forms of trafficking, especially uh, in cases of sexual exploitation. One of such new forms of trafficking is sham marriages. Less than a decade ago, sham marriages mainly involved a deceptive deal with the goal to bring immigration benefits without, in many cases, a woman being a victim. However, in some European countries from 2000 around 13, 2012 onwards, a different pattern emerged. Migrant women married to the national from the third countries, mainly as it was documented by, in, in, from Pakistan, Bangladesh, Turkey, Egypt, are of very low income and some are with mental disabilities. In these cases, migrant brides to third nationals received no money at all for the marriage deal, only food or phone. Increasing evidence being disclosed as severe levels of sexual exploitation of these women. In all cases, the perpetrators were their potential third country national husbands and 
or fra friends of their potential husbands. For most women, these sexual assaults were repeated over weeks, months, and in some cases, years. In some cases, migrant women had been asked to approach other women to recruit them for so-called marriage. There was also a deliberate intention to exploit, uh, exploit and in the vast majority of cases documented, the exploitation was severe and ongoing. The forms of exploitation were multiple and overlapping, including sexual, physical, psychological abuse, and clearly the women were controlled and isolated. Such cases were recorded uh, especially in Ireland around 2010. And it is to note that no woman who was subjected to exploitation within the context of such sham marriage was identified as a victim of trafficking by the Irish authorities at that time, nor assistance for them was provided. It is obvious that in order to assist the victim of, traffic, of trafficking, you must to identify her. As a conclusion, I say that all three elements of referral system, that is prevention, identification, and assistance are highly important because they are fully interlinked uh, with each other and must be tackled in a holistic way. Because preventing trafficking, it is also assisting potential victims of the crime. And it is also reaching and addressing the demand side. Thank you very much. Dalia, thank you so much for your presentation, the very comprehensive uh, presentation. And I want to uh, take this opportunity to also congratulate you for your work and obviously the, the recent uh, document that was produced under your leadership. So it's very good to see, congratulations. Um, at the same time, I feel the need also because we will have the commission with us next to, to say how projects such as these are extremely important for all the reasons that uh, Dalia already highlighted and the specific needs for assistance that migrant women and girls have. Having said that, it's also important not to forget that Trafficking goes beyond migration in a sense. For example, we know, I'm talking only about the European Union now, we know that at about half of the victims of trafficking for sexual exploitation uh, and women and girls are uh, European citizens. And it's very important to draw caution on focusing only on the vulnerability side because the, the reality is that the profit makers maybe less the profit makers, but certainly the exploiters are the same people. They don't mind whether or care whether the victim is an EU citizen or not, or a, a migrant person. Obviously, uh, migrant women have particular needs and vulnerabilities and needs for assistance, which you are highlighting, but it's important to ensure that we decoupled migration uh, from trafficking. And we have uh, uh, the commission with us to tell uh, today to tell us a little bit more how the Commission is dealing uh, with, uh, with trafficking these days. We have the EU directive that is clear in Article 18 on the legal obligation to, uh, uh, to criminalize those who use the services of victims. Um, in fact, there was a report by the Commission from 2016 on the criminalization and its findings indicated that there is a diverse legal landscape in the EU that fails to discourage demand and it fosters the crime in a sense. So the Commissioner for Home Affairs last, this time last year announced in her hearing in her uh, uh, yes in her hearing that uh, there will be a legislative proposal. So we would like to hear from the Commission whether this proposal uh, will take place, uh, whether it will be on trafficking for sexual exploitation that would be extremely important to know. And also to tell us a little bit more about, we have the Employer Sanctions Directive that criminalizes those employers who use the services and work of victims of trafficking that are illegally staying non-EU nationals. So basically EU nationals and non-EU nationals are treated differently. Going back to Dalia's point, I think this is important. So maybe you can tell us uh, a little bit more about that and also the plans uh, of the European Commission 
for the next uh, period. It's my great joy to uh, introduce to you my ex-colleague, the wonderful colleague, uh, Eva dimovne Kerezes. Uh, Eva, the floor is yours. A pleasure actually to be with uh, Miria, uh, the former anti-trafficking coordinator in the same panel and continue uh, working together on this uh, very pertinent uh, um, crime uh, against trafficking in human beings. So many of you, uh, actually how I prepared the presentation is uh, really with a focus on the key findings of the recent progress report and also to present uh, European Commission initiative and uh, with the dedicated attention to the EU legal framework which you all know is uh, anchored in the EU Anti-Trafficking Directive 2011-36 uh, that had to be implemented in EU member states, transposed and implemented in national legislation. And this EU legal and policy framework uh, that the European Commission works along is a victim-centered, gender-specific and a child-sensitive uh, framework. This framework addresses trafficking in human beings as a serious form of organized crime and a grave violation of, of human rights. I would uh, like just to recall that the directive uh, uh, has set actually minimum standards which are applied across the European Union uh, on preventing and combating uh, this uh, serious uh, grave violation of fundamental rights is a serious particular uh, form of organized crime and to protect its victims. This directive sets certainly the definition uh, of the criminal offense, uh, imposes sanctions for perpetrators, requ uh, sets requirements for investigating, prosecuting the crime, and also has very dedicated provisions ensuring assistance, support and protections of uh, victims of trafficking in human beings with dedicated attention also to child victims and unaccompanied uh, minors. So, uh, of course, just to recall very briefly the, the this minimum requirements uh, in the directive, which speaks about uh, uh, in the case of reasonable ground indication that someone is a victim, the victim needs to be re uh, referred for assistance, support and protection measures, which also includes uh, standards of living, uh, ensuring uh, substance, subsistence uh, support, safe accommodation, material assistance, medical treatment, psychological assistance, counseling, uh, legal counseling, representation, and uh, uh, there are are also a set of rules that actually member states had to implement in their international law. Now, I'm coming to the, um, to the European Commission's uh, progress report and key findings, and I would like to ask Anna to, to move on the slides as I'm speaking. Uh, certainly these key findings are important uh, as kind of baseline for future work of the European Commission fighting the crime. What we have seen that the crime uh, has not diminished in the European Union, but rather evolved with new risks and new threats arising. We, there are enormous number of victims, the majority of them being women and girls, uh, suffering violence and immense harms. Our recent study uh, on the human, economic and social costs of trafficking in human beings has established that roughly a year, uh, 2.7 billion uh, euro is the cost of the persistence of this crime. And these are costs which are due to uh, services needed in the area of law enforcement, health and social protection, lost economic output, the lost quality of life of victims, coordination activities, because the crime persists. This is a serious violation of fundamental rights, uh, including women and girls by committed by traffickers. Trafficking in human beings is a highly profitable form of uh, crime, bringing enormous profits to criminals. Uh, actually, we always quote uh, an estimate uh, developed in a Europol study, which speaks about roughly 30, 000, uh, 30 billion uh, euro globally, uh, estimated profit uh, just from trafficking in human beings. Uh, and uh, I would like to ask Anna to move on. Uh, actually, the first slide uh, shows that uh, in 2017 and 18, still the majority of the trafficking victims were trafficked for sexual exploitation. Uh, speakers have mentioned the very strongly gendered uh, phenomenon, the very strongly gendered uh, crime. Uh, this, is, this is a slide that actually uh, shows that when we can see that out of 10 victims uh, of sexual exploitation, nine are women and girls. The report 
also uh, identified based on reports from member states, civil society organizations, uh, which are the key uh, high risk environment. And also the report defines a number of uh, actions and support uh, measures uh, which have taken place, including in terms of law enforcement and judicial cooperation within the European Union. We have seen uh, from the reporting the increasing use of internet and new technology as clear uh, danger, as evolving trend uh, uh, recruitment, exploitation, control of victims takes place, uh, uh, mainly women and girls uh, groomed also for uh, sexual exploitation. If we can move on, please. Yes, we have seen that trafficking for labor exploitation actually uh, is also a significant uh, part uh, of, the, of the victims within the EU the last two years. Uh, we can see also that the majority of the victims are men. However, there are uh, women predominantly exploited in domestic sectors, uh, work care activities and cleaning services. And we have also seen the high risk sectors and environment uh, for these forms of exploitation. If we can move on the next slide, I would just like to flash for the participants participants, which speaks uh, about uh, other forms of exploitations that took place in 2017 and 18 within the European Union, uh, including forced criminality, forced begging, uh, forced marriages, trafficking for organ removal, selling of babies, uh, trafficking for illegal adoptions, uh, and some other forms. We can move on, please. Uh, uh, as mentioned, uh, trafficking, uh, the, our data, the evidence on European level very clearly shows that uh, the majority of, the, of all the victims within the European Union are women and girls. And we can move on. The next slide, please. And uh, with regard to the concerning uh, uh, existence of child trafficking. Uh, this is the available most recent data on European level, which shows that uh, out of four victims, uh, uh, there is always one child. The vast majority of these uh, children uh, trafficked are girls, and nearly three quarters uh, of the child trafficked are EU citizens. We can move on, please. Uh, this is the ratio to show that uh, roughly half of all the victims are EU citizens. And uh, when it comes to non-EU victims, uh, there are around uh, 45%. Uh, and when it comes to own nationals uh, or within, trafficked within the EU member states, this is also a significant uh, proportion, as the slide uh, indicates. Uh, when it comes to non-EU victims, nearly three quarters of non-EU victims were women and trafficking for sexual exploitation, 55% was the main form. 69% of child victims with non-EU citizenships were also girls. So we can move on, please. Uh, these are the key nationalities of victims uh, uh, based on the reporting from member states in 2017 and 2018. We can move on, please. Yes, this is the forms of exploitations. And if we can move on, please, I already uh, recall this. Uh, Non-EU victims, yes, uh, the majority of them are 71% are women I am and sorry girls. to interrupt, but uh, there's 10 minutes, 10 minutes. So please uh, speed up. It's been 10 minutes. Yes, we can move on, please. Uh, we can move on, please. Uh, anyway, the slide I think will be available. Let's stop here, please. Thank you so much. So we have seen from the reports that traffickers' modus operandi have changed due to the rapid development of internet and online services. And uh, the internet and social media have been among the forms of recruitment, control, and exploitation of victims. And it's very important to note, and the report highlights, that technology can uh, play an important role in preventing and disrupting the offenses of trafficking in human beings. We have also seen in the report the exacerbated uh, uh, impact of COVID-19, the pandemic, when it comes to vulnerability to trafficking and making it more difficult, both the detection of the crime and the appropriate law enforcement responses. Uh, the report is also very specific in the context of migration, speaking about heightened risk of trafficking in the migration complex. We know that Trafficking networks abuse asylum procedures, mainly for the purposes of sexual exploitation of victims. Women applying for international protection were reported to particularly at risk of falling victim of trafficking and other forms of gender-based violence, such as rape, domestic violence, in particular due to difficulties in assessing safe accommodation and adequate counseling. Children in migration uh, and including unaccompanied children are especially uh, vulnerable to trafficking and different forms of exploitation. 
For this reason, the Commission's communication very recently on the new Pact on Migration and Asylum announced that the early identification of potential non-EU victims will be an important uh, theme for the upcoming Commission uh, approach towards the eradication of trafficking in human beings. Our progress report also identified, because it's based on civil society organizations reporting member state and EU agencies, that there were a number of additional concerns with respect to the migration context when it comes to differences on policies and rules applicable to non-EU victims, which may affect uh, assistance and protection of victims, including those who apply for international protection. And also when uh, victims of human trafficking are transferred back to their country where they were exploited, the country of their first arrivals. And they can, there is a risk, a clear risk of being re-trafficked. Uh, ensuring that victims receive appropriate gender-specific and child-sensitive assistance, support and protection is essential. This has been uh, brought into the attention and actually flagged by uh, many of the stakeholders. Uh, special attention should be paid to the most vulnerable people, including women and children, and address the phenomenon also in relation to labor, social policies, education and migration. I would like just to recall that the currently open uh, call for proposal on trafficking in human beings actually on a regular basis uh, uh, has very dedicated uh, uh, requirements to take into account the gender dimension of the crime when it comes to the integration of third country national victims of trafficking in human beings. So there are a number of challenges that remain and this was flagged also by civil society organizations in, in, when it comes to the inconsistent application of recovery and reflection period across member states when it comes to uh, early legal intervention and training for professionals who are involved in the identity identification process, uh, so making sure that victims uh, are identified and uh, also when it comes to the non-punishment clause for victims, so victims should not be uh, uh, sanctioned for crimes they were compelled to commit when they were actually in their exploitation. And uh, also compensation to victims, as was already mentioned by the previous uh, panelists, was also flagged as an issue uh, that needs to be further addressed. I would just like to sum up, because what we have seen in the Commission Progress Report, that there is a high number of victims and the number of uh, prosecutions and convictions remain consistent in law and especially law and especially when we when we see that um, that uh, what comes actually across uh, in uh, reporting systems is just the peak of the iceberg and when we know that there is significantly higher numbers of victims of trafficking identification uh, becomes extremely important and also uh, addressing the culture of the impunity of perpetrators exploiters profiteers the report is actually presenting verified progress in transnational cooperation uh, when it comes within the eu and also non-eu countries including cross border law enforcement, judicial cooperation actions, when it comes to uh, putting in place and improving national and transnational referral mechanisms and improving knowledge on, about the phenomenon. So uh, uh, the number of prosecutions and convictions remains low and the legal landscape on criminalizing the use of services exacted from victims of trafficking, as our uh, uh, chair already mentioned, may hamper further efforts to discourage demand for such services. Uh, the report also concludes that actually when it comes to assistance support and protection measures, there is a need to address uh, the specific forms of exploitations and also the gender and the age of the victims and the specific needs concerning the particular circumstances. Certainly for the European Commission, the transposition and implementation of the anti-trafficking uh, directive uh, remains a key and step up efforts there. In this sense, uh, uh, because of the insufficient progress made so far and because of the uh, evolving trends on trafficking, actually uh, the, there will be new actions developed in the context of the agenda on tackling organized crime as part of the EU Security Union strategy and many actions uh, are also uh, foreseen related to the new pact on migration and asylum for example the very recent uh, one the EU action plan on integration and inclusion but also trafficking has to be addressed cross-cuttingly and therefore uh, this is also closely related to the EU victim rights strategy and gender equality strategy. I will stop here thank you very much for the patience and for the extra time. Thank you so much. Thank you, Eva. Uh, thank you for presenting the third progress report. So I guess from the report that there follows the identical structure and headings and everything from the second report is uh, the, exactly the same uh, political direction. We can uh, kind of see the way that the Commission will be moving uh, ahead. Um, I, I was struck to see once 
more uh, the, the large number of victims for sexual exploitation, despite all the efforts to stop the, 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 this trend, despite all the malintended, based on by financial interest um, uh, efforts to divert attention to other issues, uh, sexual exploitation is still, of course, the leading uh, cause of exploitation. Allow me to say something before I move to our next speaker. First of all, of course, the law is fundamental, but we also need to see uh, whether the Commission will be using its powers with infringements towards member states that have not actually uh, uh, fully implemented the EU law. So it would be good to, to know about that. Also, um, both the Dahlia and Eva focused a lot on vulnerabilities and in the beginning, of course, our speakers. And this is important, but I think it's also dangerous to focus only on vulnerabilities because what we're doing by, by doing this is protecting the root causes, the driving forces, the perpetrators, the profit makers, the users and the abusers. People are vulnerable for different reasons. They're vulnerable because they are migrants, uh, women, because they're migrants, because they're children, because they, uh, they come from different places. But the fact remains, is not about who is vulnerable, it's about who is exploiting their vulnerability. So this man, predominantly man, who goes out and pays for sexual services, he will do so from a, a, a victim uh, who is uh, an adult, who is a child, who is a migrant. So I think really, why are we hiding behind that instead of, foc instead of saying who did this to these migrant women, to these extremely vulnerable women? And I don't think we're asking these questions uh, enough. We will now uh, move on and I hope that we will get a little bit more, some more answers on, on these issues um, uh, from our next uh, presentation. That is from Odir, uh, very, uh, very important uh, stakeholders, if you like, in this line of work, in, in the work on trafficking in human beings. And I hope that there is a lot more focus now in their work on trafficking for sexual exploitation, because for a number of years, it was really, really sidelined on their agenda. So it's good to have them on board today. And it's good to have Tatiana Kotliarenko, I hope I said this correctly, to talk to us a little bit more uh, about the, um, uh, the OSC or dear uh, UN report and the recommendations on trafficking. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. So um, um, I will be speaking a bit today about findings of the ODIR and UN Women Policy Survey reports and recommendations that do have a very strong fo focus on uh, gender dynamics trafficking during COVID-19. Um, and its also impact on uh, migrant women. So just as a bit of a background uh, to who participated in this, we did two, we actually uh, did two surveys, one of survivors of traffic with a response rate from 41 countries and two from frontline stakeholders with a response rate of 103 countries. So we were able to gather evidence uh, almost all across the world. With regards to the survey of survivors of trafficking, the highest percentage of survivor respondents represented the United States, Canada, and South Africa. With regards to uh, the survey of frontline stakeholders, and this also has a gender dynamic, 87.4%, um, especially within the OSC region, which covers all of the EU countries, were women. Um, so it also demonstrates that it's not only women who are exploited, but it's also women who are working to assist survivors and victims of trafficking uh, throughout, predominantly. Uh, one of the things actually uh, that um, I wanted to also focus on is that with, with COVID-19, um, there have been many changes from the fact that um, many survivors and victims of trafficking who are predominantly women in this particular case had a uh, lack of access to even the basics like food and water. The other factors is that those that have been able to receive services were poorly informed about changes in their service provision. Uh, about half of the survivors experienced delays in receiving statutory status of victim of trafficking and other types of legal procedures. These delays negatively affected the survivor's ability to access shelter, accommodation, reunification with their children and financial compensation. 
More than half of the survivors believe that the COVID-19 pandemic has exacerbated the vulnerability of at-risk groups to trafficking in human beings. They noted that the economic downturn will increase this vulnerability to recruitment by traffickers and the risk of re-victimization re 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 of survivors. They added that these factors are further negatively impacted by reprioritization of human and financial resources by government institutions to fight the COVID-19 pandemic. From the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic, every third survivor responded was targeted with at least one or several offers which were directly or potentially related to possible exploitation. The most common offers were employment in the same countries, in the same country, including offers from the sex industry, which, um, as Mary has noted, uh, you know, significantly impacts women and girls. And traffickers are not standing still right now. They're using the situation to further target, groom, and recruit women and children into the sex industry. Um, also, in most cases, these offers were made online, suggesting that online forms of recruitment by traffickers continued and significantly increased during the pandemic. Victims of trafficking who are currently in situations of exploitation may also be facing new or more severe forms of exploitation due to the financial downturn, which has affected the traffickers' ability to generate uh, profits. Moreover, victims of trafficking are also at a higher risk of contact, contracting COVID-19 due to their trafficking situation. And as you will see, most of the slides actually have um, quotes from survivors of trafficking who have answered the survey. The survey of frontline stakeholders clearly showed that the government's capacity to combat trafficking in human beings has been negatively impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. This impact is particularly evident in the following areas, identification procedures, sheltered accommodation, and social services. Furthermore, the proper functioning of national referral mechanisms or equivalent systems has also been affected. Approximately half of the countries currently have a partially operational national referral mechanism or equivalent system. One general finding is that countries with NRMs have been better able to address the vulnerability to trafficking of at-risk populations and to re-trafficking of survivors of trafficking compared with countries without national referral mechanisms. According to frontline stakeholders, it has become more difficult for victims and survivors of trafficking to access rehabilitation services, administrative procedures, and protection, as stated by an overwhelming majority of respondents. And that's something to actually keep in mind. And as I said here, we're specifically also looking at women. While traffickers have been able to quickly adapt their activities to the online sphere during the COVID-19 pandemic, government agencies and civil society have had difficulty doing so. Approximately nine out of 10 respondent organizations are able to provide access to services to their beneficiaries, but mostly by phone. Survivors also noted that, noted that access to online tools or simply access to Wi-Fi can be costly and inaccessible to them. Emerging trafficking trends and consequences due to the COVID-19 pandemic are marked by gender-specific vulnerabilities and are further exacerbated by already existing gender inequalities. Prior to the pandemic, women and girls constituted the majority of detected victims of trafficking, and it is likely that this trend will continue during and the, in the aftermath of the pandemic, especially impacting marginalized communities. Respondents reported an increased vulnerability of women and girls to trafficking for the purpose of sexual exploitation, especially women in physical locations and girls online. The COVID-19 pandemic has also exacerbated the vulnerabilities of children to trafficking in human beings, which requires the preparedness of all stakeholders to provide additional services for trafficked children as a result during and post pandemic. For instance, online sexual exploitation of children is increasing in leaps and bounds during the COVID-19 pandemic. In addition, the implementation of emergency measures has resulted in the halting of identification procedures of children in general. The survey results demonstrate that migrants have been identified as one of the main at-risk groups during, uh, to trafficking human beings during and after the COVID-19 pandemic. This must be considered against the background of available evidence that groups such as migrant women are already the majority of identified victims of trafficking uh, globally. The impact of travel restriction on migrants is likely to increase their vulnerability to trafficking due to the disruption in travel plans or loss of income. 
according to you and women, the travel restrictions may lead to the exacerbation of already difficult work and living conditions, especially for women migrants in general. As a result, many migrants, in particular women, were left stranded and availed themselves of repatriation efforts put in place by their countries of origin. Asylum seeking women and girls were at particular risk of violence, trafficking, and exploitation in the weeks following the lockdown as they became deprived of essential services for victims of sexual violence and other forms of gender based violence that were available in refugee camps before COVID 19. Due to the expiration of residence permit during the pandemic, many female migrant workers have become undocumented and may have lost their jobs, and others may be forced to continue working without adequate preventive measures. For instance, women, and especially young women, who make up a large proportion of migrant domestic workers are increasingly at risk by being, <clears throat> of being exploited by employers who insist that they work on days off and threaten them with dismissal in case of non-compliance. In Europe, female domestic workers from Romania and Moldova have been dismissed and left in the street, homeless and destitute, placing them at immediate risk of trafficking and sexual exploitation. In some countries, these developments are worsened by rising anti-migrant tensions, leading to restriction, restrictions and already limited health services for migrant women, including access to maternity care and specialist services for survivors of sexual violence, sex, sexual exploitation, and female genital mutilation. One of the very key findings that we have found is, is that many civil society organizations that are providing services on the ground have lost their ability to operate because of loss of funding, which means half of civil society organizations operating um, on the ground, which do provide these very essential services um, to women and girls, um, will be only half operational and one in 28 are likely to close. So this is actually one um, very, very urgent finding. Um, other, other things we have found is, is that uh, without addressing demand in their policies, countries are not likely to move forward on these issues. So we've created a set of recommendations in 11 areas, and one of them specifically deals with um, male toxic behavior, which needs to be addressed, and engaging men um, in uh, preventive efforts and re-educating the approach to this. Another actually area we're looking at and we're going to actually also focus on with guidance um, in the upcoming months is trafficking for the purposes of pornography production and child sexual abuse materials. So ODIR is back on all of these issues. So this is coming out in, in the next few months. Um, another point is engagement of survivors and the key necessity of that happening on national and international levels. So one of the things I actually want to flag um, to all of you here is, is that on January 25th, uh, OSCE ODIR will be launching the International Survivors of Trafficking Advisory Council, composed of um, 21 survivor leaders from 14 different countries. Many of the countries are actually EU countries as well. Um, uh, and it also reflects the detection dynamics where three quarters of the survivors are women. Uh, some are migrant women, some who have been trafficked domestically. So there'll be a very, you know, very, very strong gender dynamic um, to their engagement on issues of trafficking. And they will be able to provide policy advice and be engaged with all of you. And they're an incredible set of um, primarily women, but also men who've also been trafficked for the purposes of sexual exploitation, actually, and are quite engaged on this issue as well. So um, if you would like to see the report, I could put the link um, in, into the chat and it's available in French, Spanish, English, and Russian. Tatiana, most thanks. And I wish we had double the time. You've, uh, you've, uh, you've told us many, many interesting things here and thank you for, for your time. And um, I just, I, I want to ask a very specific question in my capacity as chair. Um, in, you talk about survivors and then in one slide, you talk about victims and survivors. Can I ask, if there is a difference for a deer or why you tend to use survivors. 
So there, there, there are two, there, there are specific differences because we have actually, ODIR has worked hard in the OSC region to even bring the word survivors to some sort of acceptance because many countries don't accept it because it's not a legal term. So for the purposes of criminal justice, um, survivors are recognized as victims, which provides them with a set of rights. Um, also, some victims do not feel immediately that they're survivors of an issue, so it's, an, it's, it's language that we actually um, allow choice of, or not even allow, but this is for those that have experienced the crime of trafficking to decide whether they're a victim, whether they're a survivor, or how they would like to use that language. Survivor is a term of empowerment for okay. us. Thanks very much. I wanted to clarify, uh, and I understand, uh, at the same time, it's extremely important to ensure that um, victims are not strict of their rights and they have rights as victims, not as survivors. Clearly, uh, a, being a survivor is a question of, as you explained, of personal uh, interpretation, if you like, of empowerment. But of course, people are uh, uh, victims and they should, we should remember that uh, at all times. Uh, it's very, very good to hear of your, the launch of your initiatives uh, and we look forward to it. Um, and also to hear of uh, your uh, upcoming work on pornography production. I think this is fundamental. So it's good to see that I have to say I was uh, in my professional capacity, I was very worried about Odir's absence from these issues and very glad to see personally that uh, this is uh, back uh, with such a strength. Also, I'm very glad to see the results. One of your, the many recommendations I'm sure you have, we will look at the report online um, on uh, demand reduction, because at the end of the day, as you say, whether they're survivors, victims, uh, migrants, they are victims of trafficking who who, and they are victims because someone abused them, someone exploited them and someone profited from them. And if we shift attention all the time away from that, we will not get very far. So it's very good to, to hear that. Thanks again, Tatiana. Next time we will make sure you have double the time. Um, and uh, I say goodbye and I will move on to our last speaker. Uh, very, I hope uh, for a very interesting presentation. I know everybody's looking forward to this. Um, uh, yeah, this is a presentation by Simona Lanzoni, uh, the vice chair of the Gravio Committee. Um, and I hope to hear from Simona uh, a lot on the um, uh, Istanbul Convention, of course, and the violence against women framework. And what we're particularly interested to see, of course, is the links, the clear and obvious links between trafficking in, in human beings and violence against women and how that relates to the Istanbul Conve Convention. Thanks to all of you for the invitation. So the Istanbul Convention covers all forms of violence against women, which, is, uh, which has been defined in Article 3A, and it requires the criminalization of several specific types of conduct. And Gravio have links the um, human trafficking and prostitution in the first monitoring that we had in France, where violence against women include prostitution, because France, from April 2016, officially recognized prostitution as a form of violence in itself and a violence that is particularly direct against women. Gravio points out in this respect that the Istanbul Convention does not cover prostitution as such. While it is therefore not within Gravio mandate to examine this dimension, Gravio wish to recall the, ex the exposure of women prostituted to violence from client, pimps, network, but also from delinquencies and people in the street, as well as their stigmatization. These circumstances call for policies and measures on violence against women to take into account the multiple discrimination to which women in prostitution are exposed. While there are many linkages between prostitution and human exploitation and trafficking and violence, and despite the recognition that in many cases the exploitation of a woman and a girl through prostitution form part of a continuum of the violence against her, the drafter of the Istanbul Convention refrained from covering the conduct already dealt with the other Council of Europe legal instrument. And as you know, um, the Convention on Action Against Trafficking a Human Being and the Convention on the Protection of Children 
uh, against sexual exp exploitation are the main that are covering this. Uh, anyway, uh, for us was very interesting, uh, the, the, um, we can say the, the challenge that France put uh, in front of us. Consequently, uh, even if uh, uh, the Istanbul Convention does not contain an express reference to prostitution and uh, human trafficking and exploitation, and does not consider the prostitution of a woman as a form of violence against a woman, nor does it take a stand on uh, the type of policy approach that state parties should favor in relation to prostitution. And it does, however, require that its measure shall be implemented in a way that is beneficial to all women, including women in prostitution, and so women that are exploited. This is particularly important where protection and support of any gender-based violence experienced by women in prostitution is concerned. In addition, the Istanbul Convention contains a few specific provisions that seeks to address a certain type of conduct that border on prostitution and that are harmful to women and children. For example, it criminalizes cases where individuals, including partner, cause women to engage in non-consensual and sometimes remunerated sexual act uh, in order to um, exert power and control over them. It also requires that in any civil or criminal proceeding, evidence related to the sexual history and conduct of the victim shall be used only if the means relevant or necessary. Thus, women engagement in prostitution should not be used to systematically discredit their allegation and re-victimize them in court. The convention also seeks to ensure support and protection for children who witness an act of violence against their mother, a situation that could arise in the, cost, in the context of prostitution. Other Council of Europe instruments, uh, as I told you, are the specialist. Uh, and the Convention on Action uh, on Trafficking in Human Beings uh, address exploitation in prostitution in the context of human trafficking under, under Article 4. And the Lanzarote Convention is talking about children. In view, of the above, uh, in view of the above, the scope of the Istanbul Convention in relation to prostitution focuses predominantly in the support and protection of women and girls who engage in prostitution for any instances of gender-based violence that uh, they may experience. It also seeks to ensure the prosecution of any criminal offense perpetrated against them, in particular sexual violence and physical violence, and aim to close the criminal law uh, that have previously existed. And um, finally, prostitution in itself is not considered a form of violence against women, as I told you, but um, uh, where prostitution form part of the trafficking in women for the purpose of sexual exploitation, this would come into the remit of the uh, Convention on Action Against Trafficking in Human Beings. Um, so Gravio approach cover issue around prostitution in its monitoring in any case, and it should however be noted that the reality of women experiences resulting from the mix of violence, exploitation and dependency are extremely varied and do not always correspond to the concept and definition set out in the existing legal instrument. Sexual exploitation, the trafficking of women uh, for the purpose of sexual exploitation and abusive relationship may overlap. And any uh, new perspective which the Istanbul Convention can bring to this should be harnessed. Uh, so what we have done from the from the first uh, report in France, we integrated uh, questions also related to women in prostitution uh, and exploitation that can, can uh, be exposed to sexual, physical, and other violence against women in the context of prostitution. And uh, um, in the domestic violence, 
in the history of childhood abuse um, among women in prostitution. And uh, we use this uh, um, approach to monitor also um, all the, um, the, the, the women that are at risk of discrimination uh, because they are in prostitution. Uh, it is important also that we address also data collection on violence affecting women in prostitution and also femicide related to this. Uh, and um, we address uh, uh, access to specialized and general support services also for them. So I understand that Gravio is not, um, as, uh, as you can understand, the main body, but at the same time, we are trying our best to cover and to help women that face violence, gender-based violence uh, in the, uh, their exploitation experience. Uh, uh, to, uh, to arrive to access to any service, uh, services and uh, that can protect them and uh, prosecute the violence that they are, uh, they are facing. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Simona, and thank you for uh, clarifying. For me, it became crystal clear how uh, Crevio is, is working on this and the Istanbul Convention, and I think that's, uh, that's fundamental for everyone to understand. You also highlighted something that um, is fundamental and is the white elephant in the room. As the leaders of the law enforcement throughout the member states explained to us that not everyone, not all women and girls or everyone in prostitution is a victim of trafficking, this much is clear, but all the victims of trafficking for the purpose of sexual exploitation are in prostitution. So the links are crystal clear. So I think what we do often is that we don't want to use trigger words. There is no trigger here. There is uh, a phenomenon uh, that often relates to extreme abuse and exploitation of women. And as per the EU treaty and as per uh, UN at the, at the international level and the, and the regional level, we know that uh, there are clear guidance, obligations on the exploitation of the prostitution of others. Now, in those cases where it's not exploitation, we're not dealing with those, but we have to deal with the rest. And avoiding discussing the issue of prostitution, I don't think it helps anybody. I think trying to highlight the need to understand the links between prostitution and trafficking for sexual exploitation and certainly violence against women on a broader scale is uh, extremely important. It's also extremely important, and I want to wrap up and open the floor for, uh, for questions. It's extremely important to uh, ensure that with all these presentations, we understand that behind the women in prostitution that you're mentioning, that are exploited, behind the migrant women and girls that were mentioned by Dahlia, behind the survivors that were, me were mentioned by your dear, there's always an exploiter. There is no victim without an exploiter. And I think that we have to make sure that we remember to say that every time, because we come, uh, we call, if we call it the trafficking chain from the moment a young woman is uh, at her house and about to be lured by the trafficker all the way to the victimization, coming to the very end of this process, it's too late. Yes, we have to assist. Yes, it's our job to do all this. Yes, it's our job to ensure that vulnerabilities are addressed. But, you know, my grandma is vulnerable. She is not trafficked. We have to talk about who traffics these women, these girls, and why. And it's the same for all sorts of uh, issues, contested issues in this area of organized criminality. Many of you mentioned the difficulty in detection. Last time I checked, there were terrorist attacks throughout Europe despite the fantastic work at the EU level and at the national level that is being done to address terrorism and radicalization. Of course, crime is difficult. Of course, it's difficult to detect the perpetrators and to know in advance about the victims. But that doesn't mean that it's an excuse. The more we prioritize, the more likely we are to address it. So the issue of political will comes back. The issue of the legal sector and economy we need to find out who is profiting. We need to know that. Tatiana was mentioning about 
girls being lured by, uh, by, by the sex industry. Who? What is the sex industry? Is it some vague thing? Who? Who? Which person? Uh, you know, uh, got in touch with the uh, with the proposed victim. Then we need to know. And this is very good that uh, that precisely you're highlighting these issues. And I think this panel has been very nicely wrapped up by you because you highlight exactly uh, where we need to uh, to focus our attention. We have a little time now, and there is a, a, a number of, uh, of questions. Um, and I don't know who, uh, whether all our panelists are online, I hope they are. But I will give the first question to Eva because I'm aware or that she will have to, uh, to attend another meeting soon. Uh, and I will just read what it says. It says, uh, Dr. Vasiliado, that's me by the way, recognize the need to target demand and sexual exploitation is recognized as a euro crime in the Treaty of the European Union in Article 83.1, but it is not legislated on. In the upcoming laws on, on, on violence against women in 2021, I hope I'm saying this correctly, is the team working to ensure that sexual exploitation is included as a key gap in current laws? Eva, could you please uh, help us with this question that comes from Katriona Graham. Thank you, Miriam. And uh, I will try to address not only this question, but also your introductory questions, if you are fine with this, before of I made, because initially I prepared with the progress report and I the know. findings okay. and the EU initiatives, but I would not like to leave unaddressed your questions that you addressed. I've been there actually. and I know how hard, the, how hard it is to cover everything in such a little time. Thank you for being okay. with us, Eva. Okay. So thank you so much for uh, Katriona's question. Actually, this is, uh, uh, I, I have to say, uh, we are in very close contact with our colleague in the Commission. This is not the anti-trafficking team, which certainly works on this big initiative of the European Commission addressing and tackling gender-based violence against women. But we are in close contact uh, with our colleagues. And yes, indeed, stakeholders call on the European Commission to include other aspects of sexual exploitation of women, not only trafficking in human beings, because Currently, trafficking in human beings is clearly in Article 83.1 of the treaty. So there is a very, very strong call, an upcoming initiative, legislative initiative to address gender-based violence. And actually, um, maybe it's really an excellent moment. There is a public consultation, open public consultation, and really to hear the voice and, uh, you know, to influence the decision making and, uh, and contribute to these processes. Then uh, the chair also asked me, Miria, thank you so much for the question, uh, what the European European Commission is doing about uh, implementation and transposition of the anti-trafficking directive. I would also like to uh, address this uh, certainly since the 2016 what we call transposition report when the Commission actually uh, checked uh, how member states transposed and implemented the uh, provisions of the anti-trafficking directive in national laws. Actually there were very key findings uh, with respect exactly to assistance support and protection measures that we have been following up uh, even last year and uh, certainly Certainly, uh, the Commission uh, will, uh, as it follow up uh, the findings and the exchanges with member states uh, that took place last year uh, uh, with regard to its powers under the treaty and if necessary uh, launching infringement procedures. That's important to address. I also would like to uh, come on, on to your point and I'm sorry that I have to leave earlier the meeting and uh, this is uh, concerning the criminalization uh, of use of services of victims of trafficking. Currently the, the directive says that member states have to consider the criminalization of the knowing use of services of victims of trafficking. The Commission has issued a report also back to 2016. In the regular progress report every, uh, every two years, uh, we follow up national legislations, initiatives uh, in this regard. This was the case also in this third progress report in uh, 2020, which not only uh, checks which are the national legislations uh, in this taken place to address demand uh, and uh, reduce demand, but also uh, collect data. And we actually try to make sure that member states report prosecutions and convictions uh, under their national criminal provisions uh, uh, for criminalizing the, the use of services exacted from victims of trafficking in human beings, and there is a number of reflections uh, now taking place in this regard. And with regard to the employer sanction directive, actually this is a very pertinent point that was already addressed in the com by the Commission in the 2016, what we call the user report in our EU jargon. 
which actually checked uh, how member states, what type of provisions uh, are in place to consider the criminalization of use of services of victims. And actually, in this regard, uh, uh, it was uh, the, the report also took into account the employer sanction directive, which actually imposes concrete, clear sanctions when it comes to uh, non EU uh, victims of uh, third country nationals and trafficked uh, in the EU. And there were very significant and important uh, conclusions uh, in place uh, also with this regard. Thank you so much. Eva, thank you so much, because I think actually your uh, your statement now is, uh, is extremely important to clarify how uh, the Commission is, is moving ahead and very useful for the work that needs to be done. I have no doubts we're in the, in the right direction. So there is a question on vulnerability that I think has been addressed uh, very clearly. Of course, we need to focus on vulnerabilities. Of course, they matter, but it is very dangerous to focus only on vulnerability because what we tend to do is deviate from the driving forces of trafficking that is the profit and the exploiters by focusing on vulnerability it's a little bit like a term in, a end of life care it comes at the very end it comes or and even if it comes at the beginning we want to stop people from being raped in this instance from not being vulnerable to being raped. What's the difference between that and when we talk about women in the short skirt? Don't wear a short skirt so that you're not trafficked. This is not how the debate should be going. The debate is why is there someone, an exploiter and a profit maker that remain unpunished? So I'm very, very happy and very honored to be with such excellent speakers. And we see what is very interesting to me that we see at the Council of Europe level, at the UN level, at the OSC or DEER, if you like, level and the European Commission level, we seem to be heading finally and after, I dare say, over a decade in a very useful and a right direction. And I hope this continu continues. In my personal experience over the last 10 years, this was the direction we've been trying to take, and I'm glad to see this materialize. Thank you to all the speakers and don't hesitate to uh, contact them directly with any more questions. And thank you to Anna and the European Network of Migrant Women for inviting me to chair this. And uh, good luck to the next panelists. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Miria. Thank you so much to all the speakers. I'm, I'm, I'm really sorry we only had one and a half hour for all of your presentations. Um, I advise everyone uh, who is taking part uh, in, in the audience to follow on all the uh, reports that were mentioned, the one that uh, Eva presented from the European Commission, uh, they're all available online, the one from ODIR on uh, trafficking uh, in the context of COVID. And uh, of course, we were particularly pleased uh, with Dalia Leonard presenting um, a little overview of uh, the very, very important for us, for our organization, for migrant women, uh, including those who are victims of uh, trafficking, general recommendation number 38. And uh, especially big thank you to uh, Simona from uh, Gravio for making this very clear links between uh, violence against women and trafficking, which is a part of violence against women, of course.